Hello, welcome to Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And in this episode, we're joined by musician and music education facilitator, Elizabeth J. Birch, and the CEO of UK charity Youth Music, Matt Griffiths. They both join us to talk about the experiences of disabled musicians in the UK music industry and the work done by Elizabeth and Youth Music to improve it. Now, each Music Ally Focus episode analyzes one meaningful music business story at a time. And so this podcast is going to be quick. It should take about the same amount of time as Richard Rugg could hypothetically pick 240 locks. Richard, a man who you should probably keep on speed dial for when you forget your car keys, picked eight different locks in one minute in 2022. Now, talking of undoing a complex system designed to stop you from progressing, Elizabeth J. Birch champions accessible music making and shares her knowledge with aspiring young disabled musicians. She hopes for a day when the disabled community is not so overlooked in the music industry. And Elizabeth has now been nominated for the Inspirational Music Leader Award at this year's Youth Music Awards for her work at the Midlands Arts Centre. Now, she and Matt talked to me about her work, explain how the disabled community is still quite invisible in the UK music scene, and they talk about what can be done to improve things in a tangible way in the music industry, including platforming more disabled people on and off the stage. It's a really interesting conversation, so let's join Matt and Elizabeth now. So I'm very happy to introduce to the podcast today Elizabeth J. Birch and Youth Music CEO Matt Griffiths. Hello, Elizabeth and Matt. Hi there. Hello. Thank you both for for joining us. Now, we're going to be talking in a minute about the experiences of disabled musicians and people in the music industry and and the work that you're both doing to improve that. But first, uh, could we just have some basic introductory stuff? Can you both explain who you are and what you do? And can we start with you, please, Elizabeth? Sure. So my name is Elizabeth J. Birch. I'm a musician, vocalist, composer, producer and community musician. And I'm Matt. I'm Matt Griffiths. I'm the CEO of Youth Music. Um, we're the largest young people and music charity in the UK. And our goal is to equalise young people's access to making, learning and earning in music. Great. Thank you for that. And uh, well, let's jump straight in um, and start with you, Elizabeth, for the work that you're doing. And perhaps you can explain that in context with your background as well. So you've worked for a long time now to improve the experiences of disabled musicians and people in the music industry. So can you just talk about why you ended up going down this route and and how you go about it, please? Sure. So as a disabled person myself, I've had many experiences which contradicted my humanity, my autonomy and my creativity. And I think all too often I see and hear of stories of the disabled community being put down to a number on a spreadsheet or as someone who has to be okay with where they are, um, being grateful for the bare minimum. And I think that as humans, music is a vital part of our experience and our expression. And to be denied that opportunity just really irritates me. Um, I lead a community music project um, after being a part of community music projects myself. Um, The ones I was involved with inspired me to support the growth of others in the way that I was supported um, and to show others that um, they can also make music that's authentic to themselves um, without having to focus on their barriers or focus on um, what other people are telling them they can and can't do. And um, I believe that everyone is a musician when they come into a room and I regard them as such and I treat them as such, um, even if they've never touched a musical instrument before. Um, And I just want to challenge the perceptions of music and who makes music and encourage people to be authentic and to be free, regardless of who they are and what the barriers they face are. Yeah, of course, music is one of those great equalizers, or it should be, shouldn't it, where we we can all uh, take part. You you were mentioning there about... um, the perception of mm-hmm. um, people with disabilities uh, and, and in relation to music and performance of music and the music industry. C- could you expand on that a little bit, please, just to let us know? You mentioned there being just a number on a on, on a sheet of information. C- can you expand on that a little bit about what the reality really is? Yeah, it, no, it's, it's, it's more so the fact that the disabled community is viewed as 
you don't see many disabled musicians within mainstream media anyway, um, or not outwardly disabled musicians. Um, and I think that that visibility is increasing and improving, albeit slowly. But I think that there is a very strict viewpoint on who makes music, what music is, how it's made. And when anybody, uh, disabled or not really, when anybody deviates from that, it's met with resistance. Um, and when anybody goes, oh, well, actually, there are many ways to create music and, you know, there are many types of music you can create. There just seems to be some sort of, you know, barrier there um, to people's perceptions on what that is. When you work with people from the disabled community and you do these sort of music based workshops and sessions with them, what, what do they tell you that their personal experiences are with, with relation to, to music or experiencing music? And, and what sort of barriers do they face? Um, so a lot of uh, who I work with are young people um, and um, many of them uh, either don't have much music engagement at home or at school um, or maybe they're homeschooled, maybe um, they can't go to um, a traditional mainstream school. Um, but also I meet a lot of mm people who um like through community music projects that I was a part of a lot of people who um found barriers within breaking out in the music industry and um finding their place within the music industry and finding their voice coming through um that was also really evident um and I think a massive one that I've seen is obviously uh, like physically the accessibility of venues has been really challenging for both myself, but also for people that um, I've met and young people that I've worked with. Um, then there's things like, you know, the perception stuff that I was talking about earlier, but also like emotionally what expectations are placed on uh, music making. Um, and again, it's that like how it's made and, um, and a lot of the kind of community music I do is very, I want it to be, I don't want it to be a classroom. I don't want us to sit there all with, you know, with our hands in our laps and um, going like, oh, yes, sir. No, ma'am. You know, I don't want any of that because yeah. I think that <laughs> music is just such a free expressive thing that we should be allowed to be free in. We should allowed to have that expression and allowed to um, create music in an authentic way that's authentically how we experience the world. Um, and I think in order to facilitate that, there needs to be, of course, there needs to be boundaries in some ways, but there also needs to be that freedom of expression and that freedom of, it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what barriers you face, doesn't matter um, what you do or whatever, or how, how you think music should be made, this, you can do it. And I think that's kind of where I operate from a lot of the time. Yeah. When you do these sessions and, and, and I'm trying not to say classes, you know, when you do when you do these, these <laughs> workshop sort of gatherings of of, of people, um, yeah. what 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 do they say afterwards in terms of perhaps what their expectations were and what they got out of it? Honestly, I think that a lot of young people don't hold many expectations, um, but I think that it's the adults who accompany them, whether that's their parents, their carers, their family I think they can hold a lot of expectations um sometimes those expectations are met kind of um hesitantly of kind of like oh but that's that's not how it's usually done or like oh but you know they they can't engage in that way or they can't do that um but then I think I've I've received a lot of feedback um about how um just having the opportunity to make music has improved these young people's lives and given them the opportunity to express themselves, you know, find um, kind of what they identify with and what they gel with, um, given them an opportunity to mm. express experiences that perhaps otherwise they wouldn't have been able to. Um, and that they've noticed, you know, improvement in challenging behaviors or they've noticed improvements in um, their mood. Um, right. 
And I just think that's the power of music and that's the power that music holds is that ability to impact more areas of your life as opposed to just creatively. It impacts your mood, it impacts your physical well-being, you know, it impacts all these things. Yeah, the, the power of just being creative in itself is is, is something really important, isn't it? Um, yeah. Matt, you know, mm. you and through youth music, you know, you observe a yeah. lot of these kind of things across the country, of course, covering the UK and looking at young people and their experiences. What what does this look like from your perspective of the the needs of, let's say, young people with as part of the disabled community and what their needs are in connection with music? Um, well, for us, it's a real priority at Youth Music because our very purpose is to address inequalities and injustices, to be honest. And, you know, all young people, most people love music. And our job is to increase access to be able to make, learn and earn in music. So we make disabled young people a strategic priority in our work. And then what we rely on is the fantastic grassroots work of organisations going on across the UK, um, including the ones where Elizabeth works, and we're able to invest in quite a significant amount of activity. And what we rely on, I guess, from the grassroots organisations who are on the ground every day working with young people and disabled young musicians is that they can tell us what's happening, what the needs are, um, what some of the barriers continue to be, and indeed where the great models of good practice are. Um, and using all that information that we receive, um, which is fantastic, um, we can make the case. We can make the case not only for music, but importantly for disabled young musicians. Um, I think that's a job for the music industry to look at more closely. Um, there, I think there's some examples, yeah. but it needs to be more whole scale now. And and indeed, inclusive music education is is a term now that is much greater used every day uh, in music education in the UK, which I'm really pleased about. I think what needs to happen now is turning that into actions and scaling up this amazing work that disabled young musicians are making. Well, thanks, Matt. Let's talk about improvements then and, and, and room for improvement. Let's start with you, Matt, as, as you're just, you've introduced that idea. What sort of improvements then you mentioned sort of inclusive um, teaching around music education now. So what improvements are being made can, in a sort of tangible way? Can you give us a couple of examples? And then what's what could happen beyond that from your perspective? Yeah, well, I, I just referred to the work that Elizabeth's doing. So Mac Birmingham doing amazing work with its inclusive choir, its inclusive um, ensembles and groups. And I think what's interesting there is that they're placing this work not as an add-on, but it's core to the heart and identity of Mac Birmingham. So it becomes genuine inclusive uh, rather than the bolt on. Um, an ex organization called Open Up Music, which has really broken the boundaries in terms of assistive music te technology, um, introducing eye gaze for disabled young musicians to make sophisticated music using their eye movement. That's something that, with the help of youth music, is also being able right. to scale. So I think there's some really good pockets of great practice. And I still think for a lot of organizations, it's to get beyond that they can do a project for disabled people on a Tuesday afternoon, but then nothing else changes. What we're saying is your whole organization needs to be inclusive in its recruitment, um, in its support to staff, in its access to buildings, of course, but also in terms of the culture of a place that takes an asset-based model about the abilities of all people, um, particularly disabled people. So they're quite big goals. But for us mm. at Youth Music, that's beginning to get there. But we need to keep the momentum up so people can see what we mean through platforming, through conferences, through performances, and through the employment of disabled people. Um, because then people really begin to get it. Now, at this point, let me just take a moment to remind you that last year, Music Ally launched a series of five free courses covering everything you need to know about Amazon Music for Artists, including programming and curation, selling artist merchandise, understanding voice technology, reaching audiences via Alexa, and live streaming on Twitch. Supported by Amazon Music, these courses are all completely free to access. And now, thanks to Amazon support, Music Ally is also able to offer complimentary certification 
to any individual or company that completes all five of the courses. So what have you got to lose? Nothing, that's what, because they're all free. So you can find a link to the Amazon Music for Artists series in our show notes beneath the podcast. Elizabeth, you are involved, as Matt said, um, at this at the point of change at a, at a grassroots level and, and doing this work. What what improvements have you seen made in that world of the, the disabled community uh, exists in when they intersect with music, whether it's watching live music or performing music? What changes have you seen recently, and what do you think still needs to happen that needs to be worked on? like Matt was saying that it's absolutely amazing that organizations like youth music are increasing that opportunities for the disabled community. They're increasing awareness. You do see some disabled musicians making it into onto into festivals or um, coming out with um, their experiences. And I think that that's an absolutely brilliant thing um, and something that there should be more of. I think that there can always be more. There's always can be more of of anything, really, of any uh, movement, I suppose. I think that minorities are covered very frequently um, and in the media or um, in panels um, or um, in media. And I think that that's a really positive thing. And that's amazing that 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 those are talked about and those um, kind of justice movements are talked about. Um, but one thing that I notice a lot is that they abandon disability within that list when they list the minorities. Mm. And I think people don't fully realize that the disabled community also belong on that list. Um, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that and we increase the awareness and like I was talking about earlier, changing the perceptions of who the disabled community are and that the future generations also in the current generations, but also the future generations involve disabled people. So we need to nurture disabled people and we need to um, build them up equally. Um, it, it does feel, doesn't it? Like there's a sort of visibility issue here. Um, and and that in itself is a, it sort of feeds into the problem and it, it maintains it, doesn't it? So yeah, you, I can see what you're saying mm. by, raising visibility it will start making hopefully changes um matt earlier you touched on the idea of um things like support and guidance and mentioned some technology that you know is is helping make a difference and, and be more inclusive this is a question to both of you really like as you know, I'm, I'm thinking from the perspective of our listeners who are generally people working in the music industry and often are people with um the position to perhaps make changes, you know, um, in the way that their businesses or work happens. Um, you mentioned things like support, guidance and technology. What what things can people do in the music industry to, to, to use those sort of tools to make a change? Um, so I think they can do a lot, actually. And the first thing I'd say is potentially... Don't do it on your own. Well, definitely don't do it on your own. <laughs> There's this grassroots infrastructure that youth music supports. You know, it's it's hundreds of organisations across the UK reaching about 100,000 young people, all facing some kind of barrier in their life. Uh, and that includes work in terms of supporting amazing disabled musicians. So I think for the industry, we're increasingly talking to industry bodies about how we can help them by demonstrating what good practice looks like, which in a way moves away from some of the assumptions that it's just about getting a ramp in the building. And I know, you know, that's a crude way of looking at it, but it's much more of an asset-based model, which is about saying, actually, the diversity of your staff, including disabled people and your artists and your team on and off stage, is really good for creativity. Mm. It's like an asset-based model which is very much along the lines of the social model of disability, which is an asset. And by doing that and taking concerted steps from the board across the organization, it's not necessarily the diversity officer's job. You know, it's the organization's job to begin to employ people taking positive steps to employ disabled young musicians, disabled young executives, et cetera, et cetera. So disabled people are then more platformed. And then when we see that happening, pace is quicker um so i guess it's moving away from some of the assumptions 
and this idea that it's not our business, it's more of a kind of charity business for disabled campaigners. We need to move away from that. And there's some industry work going on, which, you know, begins to really put some meat on the bones. Um, you know, a few years ago, the proms had the first disabled conductor giving a prom, James Rose, a small, but for the proms, a significant step. Mm. Um, mm. And there's been examples ever since. So I think it's it's like it's across the organization from the CEO, the board, right the way through. It's adopted as a priority. Then you can really make change. And, you know, I'm sure Elizabeth would understand this one as well. It's like you need to put some budget behind it. You know, <laughs> you need to properly put some budget. So pragmatically every day to make these positive steps, there will be a call on budgets. You know, the charity sector can help with that, like youth music, because we can often match or, you know, pair up. Uh, but that is also a really good indication for us that an organization is taking this seriously and not just giving it lip service. Matt, if someone's listening and they're thinking, okay, I, I work in, I don't know, maybe maybe a huge major label or maybe a sort of uh, smaller indie label, let's say, hypothetically, and they say that they're thinking, okay, I, I want to support this. I think this is important, but I don't know where to start. How, where's the starting point for them? Um, in all honesty, I think, you know, the first conversation is often with an organization like music, uh, like youth music, and we'd be really happy to have that conversation. And what we're able to say is, and what are your, some of your strategic goals from a business? And where does inclusion and working with disabled people fit with that? So we can get a good sense from them about what they're thinking, even if it's really early days. And it might be a specific area of music. It might be a specific part of the UK in terms of geography. Um, but that's often a really, really good place to start. And in a way, take the leap. It's not actually a big leap, you know, to do some positive targeting in your recruitment, uh, which we can help with that identifies that there's these great artists coming through, um, disabled musicians, they're producing great sound, and we know who they are. So it's almost like they don't have to reinvent the wheel and absolutely start from scratch because this work is out there and it's really creative and it's really diverse. So I think it's the art of collaboration, really, um, is, a, is, a, is a really good place to start. Um, I think things like, you know, join the Real Living mm. Wage Foundation. We, we signed up to the Living Wage Foundation as the first culture funder to do that. And a game changer, because suddenly it's actually setting out what it actually costs and, you know, what you should pay somebody based on cost of living. And by that and its very nature, you're diversifying who is in your organization, including disabled mm. people. And you probably have to go even further in terms of disabled people because of rightly the additional support that they will need. And I will, I will put some links, of course, below the podcast to Youth Music. And uh, if people want to get in touch, I guess they can. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, Matt mentioned they're taking the leap and, and making change. Elizabeth, you've been doing that. Um, and you've been nominated for a Youth Music Award, the Inspirational Music Yay. Media Award, uh, for your work at the Midlands Arts Centre. So how, do, how does that kind of recognition... Uh, Matt, I'll talk to you in a minute about why, why you yeah. chose Elizabeth uh, for, as part of that. Mm -hmm. But how does that kind of recognition help in your work and, and sort of continue your sort of upward trajectory, if you see what I mean? Yeah, um... Well, to start with, I've, when uh, the nomination came through, I just felt so honoured to be given <laughs> this award. Um, I really have the young people I work with to thank for it, really, because they inspire me so much every time I work with them, every time I see them and hear the amazing things that they create. Um, and I think that I partly feel this will support my work because I feel like it's given me more of a platform to talk about what I think and feel about these topics, you know, about disability and about music. Um, and I, I want to build communities that aren't afraid to push the boundaries of music, uh, what it is, how it's made and who it's made by. Um, and this award has mm. given me the confidence and this nomination has given me the confidence to say, hey, maybe I actually can do that, <laughs> um, <laughs> which, you know, is, yeah. is really great. Um, yeah. And uh, no pressure, Matt, but now you have to say nice things about me. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> you preempted what uh, I was going to say, but Matt. Um, when you when you look at you know you, as we've said, you know you're looking across the whole of the UK. You, you, you're, yeah. you're running projects that are affecting hundreds of thousands of, of young people. So when you are, are picking nominees for inspirational mm. music leaders, what, what do you look for, and what has impressed you about Elizabeth, but also other people that are, are nominated? Um. Well, let's be specific. The inspirational music leader that Elizabeth's nominated for is because Elizabeth's a change maker through music. And it's really clear. What does that mean? So in terms of working with young people, puts right at the heart of Elizabeth's work what young people are telling her and the, and what they believe in, the music that they love. So it's very, very young people focused. I think that's the first thing. So the ability to be able to work with young people and respond to their needs. And as Elizabeth said at the start, rather than impose this kind of top down, this is what it has to be, which, to be honest, is, you know, is a style of music education that we can still see. And what we're doing and what Elizabeth's doing is really smashing that. So I think the involvement of young people to shape exactly the young music that they're making is really, really powerful. And, you know, thirdly, a great artist, a great musician. And, you know, that's our craft that, you know, musicians have that is being put to good use in terms of this case, in terms of Elizabeth's work, working in Birmingham, Mac Birmingham. Um, I, think, I think the last thing I'd say is it's seeing music in the round. It's not like promoting one type of music. It's not saying, I'm going to teach you this. It's taking a like holistic view and it's having in Elizabeth's palms all these different like areas of music that you can work with and then adjusting that learning style and teaching style to get the best out of young people. And, and when you do it, you, can see, you, you, you see a light bulb moment amongst young people because they're immediately engaged. And for me, it's like, you know, music's young people's favourite thing. So actually engagement should be really, really instant when you're making music. But sadly, it isn't because sometimes the music leading isn't, inspira in, isn't inspirational. And in Elizabeth's case, it absolutely is bang on. Elizabeth, but just one thing that, that Matt mentioned there, I'm just in, interested in, in for, for clarifying for listeners, is that sort of top-down versus, uh, I guess, bottom-up approach to music making. So when, you, when, you, when you're there with a group of people... Is is it is your role sort of more nurturing in that sense that you are you're, you're letting them lead the way that they make music and and what that is and, and helping draw it out? Um, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Matt. Oh, I was joking um, <laughs> about saying nice things, but thank you. Um, well, I'm serious. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so I kind of, a lot of like the projects that I run, I view myself not so much as um, a teacher. Um, I view myself more as a facilitator um, or a leader, somebody who can encourage and inspire um, the young people to uh, make music themselves. I always view the music that's being made as their music. It's not my music. Mm. Um, and um, how they are to make that and how they want to make that, how they... Um, what they want to make it about, you know, all these kinds of things is all down to them. And all I'm doing is framing it and steering it um, so that mm. they are able to do that. Um, because I think that a lot of the young people I work with, um, people deem as, um, perhaps people would deem as challenging or people mm -hmm. would deem as, um, you know, oh, well, you know, this person can't have traditional um music lessons so I think we should just leave it but actually I think that it there's so much power behind um giving that that framework and giving that kind of uh structure for somebody to be able to do that um to be able to express themselves to be able to express their creativity um so I always just view it as we're making music together and um, whichever way it goes is completely up to um, the people that I'm working with. Um, and I will mm. just follow wherever they go mm. and we'll see what happens. We'll mm. see what amazing creativity happens. I think there's an ability amongst the you know, really great music leaders to be quite comfortable with, with taking supposed risk. So you're running a session and you don't quite know which way it's going to go. 
But I think for a lot of really creative music leaders, that's great and that's the way it should be, which is interesting for some aspects of music education, which can still be kind of dictated about how it looks and feels and sounds. You know, things have moved on a lot, but I think a workforce that takes this really kind of flexible approach and is comfortable with artistic creative risk, if you see what I mean, works really well for music and even better for young people. You've, you've mentioned ways that change could could happen and is happening and ways that people can get involved. As you look into the future, let's start with you, uh, Elizabeth. What are the sort of benchmarks that you can see tangible things that will make you feel that good change and progress is happening in this space? Hmm. Um, while I think about these things a lot, this is a question I definitely want to ponder more and spend more time thinking about because I think it's a really important question. Um, I, I mean, I dream of a time where I could turn up to a venue and not have to call them first. I think that would be a really great thing. Yeah. Um, where, you know, it, it's those, it's the little things I think that I've discovered that a lot of people outside of the disabled community don't necessarily think about the things like access and is it step free? Um, is there a disabled toilet within the venue? You know, these kinds of things. Um, I would hope that one day, we wouldn't have to ask those questions and it would just be assumed. Um, but I also think that one thing that I'm really passionate about and like, I've, I think I've, I've said it multiple times, but I'll say it again, cause I, I enjoy talking about it um, <laughs> is, is that challenging of the perspective of what music is, who it's made by, how it's made. And I think one thing that I'd really love to see is um, the, is people stepping into what they are called to do as opposed to what society wants them to do. And I think that's something I'm really passionate about is people expressing themselves and expressing themselves musically in a way that is authentic as opposed to what the checklist says they need to, they need to fulfill. Uh, Matt, what about from your perspective, looking like perhaps a more zoomed out across the whole country? Yeah, and support everything that Elizabeth has said in terms of those practical steps, which are suddenly called, sometimes called additional steps or uh, additional needs, actually just become the norm, you know. Mm. So it's it's embedded. It's, it's inclusive practice. So those facilities are available across the piece, in venues, in grassroots venues, in concert halls, et cetera, in the office, in the workplace, definitely that. Um so that gets to scale. I think I'd, I'd certainly sort of focus on that for a second. Um, I think, you know, in online, in on when you're buying your instruments or in person when, you know, there are music shops that people go into, if you're a disabled young musician, um, you're catered for because you might require some assistive technology to make some great sounds, and mm. that's available. And the person at the counter or the online counter can advise you and can guide you. Um I think also there's something around when you're having a music lesson, the workforce who is working with disabled people is really confident and aware about what works and the strategies that they can employ as part of their work as a creative musician. Again, not seen as something other people do, but it's our core roles as music educators. And I think the last thing I'd say is, is platforming role models, role models like Elizabeth. So on stage, more platforming in industry awards of the great work of disabled musicians, uh, more executives being employed, uh, more internships in industry organisations uh, for disabled people who can progress within the company, pay at the real living wage. All these things that embed this practice, which does exist, and, you know, youth music is kind of, you know, responsible for a lot of this work, really, but what our core goal is to embed this across the UK. I'll put links to to uh, youth music, of course, and um, uh, Elizabeth, the work that you're doing as well, and and to the uh, the youth music awards, so pe- people can yeah. look at all the nominees uh, across all the categories as well. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Matt, as you said, people can reach out to you for for um, yeah. advice and help. Um, one final question, then, 
just to spring on you, but it hopefully is a nice question <laughs> to spring on you, which is if uh, if both of you could only pick one piece of music to listen to for the rest of your lives, what would it be? Oh my god! <laughs> Why would you do this to us? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I do want to say, Matt, if you don't say my music, I'll be deeply offended. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know the one, again, that I always come back to is kind of Blue Miles Davis? Now, that's, that's, that's been uh, mentioned a few times when I've asked this question, um, and really? understandably so because it's a classic, but why, does it, why is it meaningful to you? Musically, kind of because less is more. So mm. not going for like, you know, all the latest licks and filling up the bars with as many notes as possible, just allowing for space. Mm. And, you know, I'd say that about some other stuff that, you know, I listen to as well. I think it allows for space and, of course, you know, improvisation within that and just the texture that's created. I think I'll, I'll always probably keep going, both, keep going back to mm. Kind of Blue. Um, so that's mine if that works for you, Joe. Oh, that's fine. I will. I'll put a link to that beneath the podcast. And I agree. I think uh, often people seem to pick that one because they feel like they're going to get, if they're going to listen to one thing forever, then they're going to get a lot of new experiences from it. So I, th- I, I completely understand you. Um, yeah, uh, Elizabeth. I'm going to be really honest. I would really struggle to listen to one type of music like uh, forever. And the reason I say that is because I just love the diversity of music. That's the one thing that I enjoy the most about music. So yeah. I enjoy, you know, the, the just the breadth and the different types of music. And, you know, I'm try- I'm not trying to cop out of the answer, but I do just want to <laughs> no, preface guess, it I, by I, saying I guess that. I guess you could do some um, research and find a good good playlist that you like and you could have that then, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I would, you know, I really love um, artists like uh, Gary Newman and David Bowie. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, something like that, I think, would be, uh, I'd be okay with listening to um, forever, but I'd still struggle. Good. No, a ballpark. uh, Look, I think a ballpark uh, is okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, I, I, I will as a, as a taster, as a sort of uh, in the area uh, approximation. I'll put a link to some uh, Gary Newman and David Bowie beneath the podcast as well. So uh, that's it for now. Thank you uh, both very much, Elizabeth and Matt. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Uh, thank you again to Matt and Elizabeth for joining us. And there are links below the podcast to all of the things they mentioned. If you found it useful, please share this episode on with someone else who you think will get something out of it. And if you'd like to get in touch, I'd love to hear from you. Please email me at joe, J-O-E, at musically.com. That's joe at musically.com. We also have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which rounds up a sp- sparkling selection of the best analysis, news, marketing insight and skills from across Music Allies' suite of services. So sign up and impress your friends. Uh, Links to that and everything else are in the podcast description as ever. All right, that's it. Uh, Thanks for joining us here on the Music Ally podcast. I've been Joe Sparrow. You've been you. And until next time, farewell. (laughs) 